and our very first speaker of October, Kay Hardy Campbell, is here um, to discuss her new book, uh, Caravan of Brides. Um, Kay lived in Saudi Arabia for several years and wrote cultural features for Arab News and the Saudi Gazette. She combines the sensitivity and curiosity of a writer and musician with the international perspective of a Middle East specialist. I'm really looking forward to hearing all about this. We've been waiting um, to hear from you. So please welcome Kay to talk about your new book. Thank you Thanks, so much, Kay. Sharon. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's really fun to be here and um, to start the month of October with this talk. And uh, I appreciate your help getting me set up so that what a great team you have. My talk is not about current affairs in Saudi Arabia, but I will take questions about that at the end. It's about my book and my journey to how, how I wrote this book. And yes, so we can maybe do that at the end. And um, so you can see the cover of the book, A Caravan of Brides, um, came out actually two years ago. And to me, it's new, but to the publishing world, ah, it's two years old. It's set in Saudi Arabia. Just a refresher, where is Saudi Arabia? It's in the middle of everything. The Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, Israel's right north of it, Jordan, Iraq, everything is close by. And most poignantly, what we're seeing in the news these days is um, Iran. This is where they sent the drones from, right over there, right into that area. What's the book about? It's about the friendship between two women, a troubled college graduate who's a Saudi girl, who graduates from the American University of Beirut, who gets herself into some romantic trouble, and an old mysterious woman who kind of takes her under her wing, and she's very elderly. So it's an unlikely friendship between two different Saudi women. Oop, the other way. She's a storyteller, but there's something about her. She has an unusual personal story to tell. And she tells it. She was born a noble woman among the northern nomadic Bedouin tribes in the northern Arabian desert. And um, she herself had many struggles and adventures and she shares these adventures with the young woman and through that gives the young woman the courage to face her own future. In essence, what it is, is telling the story of modern Saudi Arabia from about 100 years ago to the present through the eyes of Saudi women. That has not been done previously in literature, as far as I know. There are many Saudi women authors. There are many authors who write about Saudi Arabia. But this particular slice of writing, no one has done before. So I was, I couldn't believe it, you know, when I started writing this, why isn't anyone doing this? Why isn't anyone telling the story from women's point of view? We do that in our own literature a lot. There's so much World War II fiction out right now that's exploring the women's point of view. I don't know if anyone's read The Nightingale. Okay. This is an example of two women in the French underground and how they lived through World War II. So it's a similar idea. I got uh, a fantastic review from Kirkus Reviews, which is kind of a very important reviewing company. They gave me a starred review. This is my debut novel. I was so shocked. I could not believe it when I got that. It was like I won the lottery, and then they named me to the best books of 2018. So that was quite a thrill. So let's get into it. People ask me, why, how did you come to write about this? And how come you went to Saudi Arabia? Well, I blame it all on the film Lawrence of Arabia. I was uh, 15 when they reissued it in Cinemascope. And I was living in Minnesota at the time. And my two older brothers said, come on, we've got to go watch this movie. And um, I don't know if you remember, Lawrence of Arabia, Dr. Zhivago, and I think Bridge on the River Kwai were all, were all issued in 90 millimeter Cinemascope. Does anyone remember those films where the, the screen goes on and on and on and the soundtrack is so fabulous? Well, I was blown away by the story the characters, the cinematography, the music. As I'm a musician since a child, the um, film score was absolutely fabulous. And the character of Lawrence, T.E. Lawrence, who's an eccentric uh, young um, army officer who ended up playing a key role in this corner of World War I, helping to 
the, get the Arab tribes, the Arab, yeah, the Arab nomadic tribes to fight against the mighty Ottoman Empire and push them out of the Holy Land. And he got involved in that and um, he ended up, if you've, has anyone not seen the movie? Have you all seen the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Okay, lots of nods. So it's been a big inspiration to me. And I used to be really embarrassed about that until I learned that Steven Spielberg, Spielberg decided to become a director because of that movie. So I figure if he can admit it, I can admit it. I also read his memoir, Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which if you haven't read it and you're interested, is a fabulous piece of literature. Um, and it got me totally um, hooked to become an Arabist. So before my senior year in high school, I took a summer course at my local university in Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota, and I began studying Arabic. Arabic is a challenging but fascinating language. They say the first 40 years of studying it are the hardest. So it's been about 40 years for me now, and I would say that's probably true because there is a written formal language and then every, I was explaining this earlier, every region has a specific dialect and you almost have to have two full languages in your head. Similar grammar, but the expressions are different and the accents are different. So on the screen up here at the top, you've got the alphabet from right to left. Um, on the left, that's the meme, um, keep calm and carry on in Arabic. It's what you need when you're studying and you're frustrated and all the accoutrements of the Arabic student, the mint tea, late night, your doodles about musicians and your grammar. It just becomes um, all encompassing and that's the world that I got into. I keep doing this. Then, well, along the way, I met my future husband who um, was my college sweetheart and somehow I roped him into studying Arabic too. We graduated, got married, and then off to Saudi Arabia we went. It's the late 70s when um, oil, there was a big oil boom and they were building up the country of Saudi Arabia from like very little infrastructure and they had to build it up really quickly. They were building roads, very few phone lines. That was before mobile telephones. So you had to wait years to get a phone because they just couldn't keep up with demand. All the desalination plants, just the company was building itself using oil wealth and they were so short of um, sensible, hard-working, liberal arts educated people that we went over there. I mean, people kept saying, you're in Minnesota, what are you going to do with your Arabic degree? And we said, I don't know. We thought we'd be academics eventually, but the oil boom called us to Saudi Arabia and we were both immediately employed. My husband was in management right away, even though he'd studied Arabic, but he was and is a math whiz and eventually went on to get his MBA. So he had common sense and a strong work ethic. No problem with him. And I started writing for the English language press over there. We lived in Jeddah on the Red Sea, the western part of the country. One of the most amazing things about, the Red, about Jeddah is it has this old city. Many um, Middle Eastern cities have an old section. They usually call it the Medina, which means city. It's the old part of town, the oldest. And for me, that was the most fascinating thing about Jeddah. It's up on, Jeddah's on the coast, up on a hill is this place called the Balad, which means the town. And there are these, now it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and there are um, multi-storied coral brick mansions with these beautiful mashrabiya, they call them, the lattice work, shutters, and they used to have walkways on the rooftops. Each extended family would live in one of these houses, multi-multi-stories, and they would have camels carry the water up the central staircase to a cistern on the roof, and then it would flow down. And there was a, a whole way of life around this part of the city, and it just captivated me. I want to tell you one reason I'm showing you all these slides is if you do read the book, you'll get a familiarity for the places and that you can keep it in your mind. Now, if I had written a Western, you would have no trouble conjuring up the images of the culture. But because we are, until now, we have very little access to Saudi Arabia, I just want to give you some snapshots of the things that influenced me and that are in the book. So there is the Balad, and that green shuttered building is in the book. I keep going the wrong way. I've got to learn here. We, okay. 
So I started writing for the English language press. The Arab News is a daily that's still published today. And I also wrote for a while for Saudi Business Magazine. And way back in 1980, I had my biggest coup. I had a cover story in the Saudi Business Magazine about women in the workforce. It was pretty prophetic, I mean, a long time ago. And they had many, many struggles ahead of them. But it was quite an adventure. And I learned so much, and I met so many interesting people specifically Saudi women. Here's um, a typical group of college girls in Saudi Arabia. This was taken by uh, about several years ago by a British journalist. And notice, yes, they have the hair covering, but they're in a college campus. They're in a female-only environment. And they're laughing. You can see they have their jeans on. And, you know, they just like, look like normal young women, except for a few pieces of fabric. And that's what I think of Saudi women when I think of them. I know we all have ideas of them being oppressed, covered in black, but the reality is much more complicated. Fortunately, it's a lot better than what we think. I got to meet musicians. Here's a famous Saudi woman musician who's playing the oud, which is the Arabic lute. And um, she's actually one of the most famous wedding singers, now in her 80s, in the city of Jeddah. And I learned about women's music. Women perform music for themselves at women-only wedding parties. They play the frame drum and they sing. This is actually by an Iraqi artist, but it gives you the idea of the colorful, private world of women where they don't have to cover up. They take the covers off when they go inside. And here's a painting by a Saudi woman artist of that same woman musician playing the oud at a, wet, at a party where the women are dancing and they're just having a great time. And she's there with her band. Here's another painting by a Saudi woman artist of women doing folk dances. So this is the world that I wanted to write about because I saw it and I experienced it when I was there. I came back here and no one knew anything about it. All we had were these stereotypes in our mind. I also became quite fascinated with the traditional costumes that you would never see unless you were you know, privy to being in a Saudi family. Nowadays, these things are coming out in the open, thanks to YouTube and the internet and changes in Saudi Arabia. What these women are wearing is like a large poncho dress. It's called a thob nashal. The woman on the right is actually a Saudi princess who's got the sleeves of her poncho draped over her head. And in front is a, it's a like, beautiful, full waist length gold necklace that you tie on at the neck and it's, you know, glittery all the way down. And she's got an underdress that's a shift that's, the whole thing is of silk and handmade embroidery. And the woman on the left here is from neighboring Bahrain showing some of the traditional jewelry. People would wear these for wedding parties, for traditional um, holidays, Ramadan nights and for big national occasions. And um, the, this is a sample of different regional styles of those dresses. And it shows women in their own environment. It's very colorful. It's not all black. I learned about the hospitality, women's hospitality. On the right there, a woman is pouring Arabian coffee, which is in, done in small, tiny cups. It's a, a green color with just a little bit of actual coffee grounds. It's almost like green tea with a touch of coffee. And on the left is the incense that they pass when you go to a woman's salon for a, a women's meeting or an afternoon tea. Someone comes in with the incense and they walk it in front of you and you're meant to waft it over yourself when you arrive and then just before the party's over. That's how you know the party's over, because they come in with the incense. And I got to know the folk dances. Here's a little gif that shows their traditional folk dances. And the most famous movement they have is the tossing of the hair from right to left. And um, that's probably recorded in Kuwait. I, I got to know um, musicians. I got fascinated with the folk dances. The men have all kinds of folk dances as well. And here's a picture of me, proof I was actually there. I'm on the left with my husband Gary and back and our Iranian English friend. We were out and about on a weekend up in the mountains above the coastal plain. And in those days, you didn't have to cover your hair. You just had to wear a long caftan and be modest. 
unbelievably, last week they just announced that they're going back to this dress code for foreign women. For many years, women had to cover with a black headscarf and wear a, co a cloak, but they've decided to just, you know, let's go back to the way it was decades ago. And here I am riding a camel. I didn't have to cover my hair, just a long caftan, and that's it. So when I was there writing, I heard about this woman. Her name is Shoma. She was the niece of Auda Abu Tai. Her mom was his sister. Her mom was very close to Auda Abu Tai. Does anyone remember who he was? Did you guys see, you saw Lawrence of Arabia. Remember Anthony Quinn? That's him on the right. And he's playing Auda Abu Tai, a very famous tribal chieftain. He was the head of the great tribal federation, the Hawaitat. So Anthony Quinn's on the right. That's the actual Auda on the left. And I would say, I think Anthony Quinn looks more like Auda than Auda does. <laughs> but um, so there was this woman, Shoma, the niece of Auda. And I heard about her. She had lived in Jeddah, and I'd missed her by about a year. She had passed away. And there was a legend about her. So I took her legend, and I thought about it. For years, I was fascinated, and I found out a little bit more about her. I even heard from her family, a few more details. And um, she's just kind of there in my mind. Here's a picture of a young Bedouin girl. Bedouin means nomadic tribe, wandering from place to place in the desert. But at times, the desert does bloom. This is probably from about 100 years ago, a stereotype. Is that what they call those photographs? And here's another one with her husband, probably. Notice the long braids and standing by the tent, and they don't look particularly prosperous, I would say, this couple. So I started to write. We moved back to the States in the mid-'80s, and I started to write down all the anecdotes and funny stories that happened to us. There were a lot of adventures and mishaps. And Gradually, I started thinking, OK, so I did that. I've written that down. But wouldn't it be fun to conjure up something fictionally? I never saw myself as a novelist, more like a storyteller, always looking, a researcher, always looking for interesting material to share and write about and investigate. And um, we were back in the States. Um, I'd done a graduate degree at Harvard in Middle Eastern Studies. So I had access to Widener Library. Widener Library has the most fantastic collection of travel books, travel histories in Arabic and English. And as an alum, I was able to get in the stacks. In those days, I could actually walk up and down the stacks. Now, now they bring it to you. But also, there's the Armenian uh, Museum in Watertown. I'm sure a lot of you realize that there's a huge Armenian community um, in greater Boston. I think it's the largest in the Western Hemisphere. As, and a lot of those people came to Boston after the end of World War I and the Armenian genocide when so many Armenians were killed. They settled there. As the generations passed, these families didn't know what to do with all the old things that the, the people brought from the old com country. Yes, question. Does it bother you for me to ask you a quick question? Yeah. I just want to make sure. I wondered if you know about the Haley Gallery in Kittery. It's owned by Armenians. No, tell me later. Hey, yes, I will. Is it okay. Armenian Armenian stuff? Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to know about that. That was right. fantastic. So at, over the years, more and more people um, were donating things like textiles. And that's where I um, eventually found myself looking for old embroidery patterns, which feed into the story. And they have rooms full of these textile collections. And one particular thing turned out to be key for me in the story. Um, after we moved back from Saudi Arabia, I started writing for Aramco World Magazine. Aramco is the oil company. I'm sure you heard it in the news. They have this fabulous free magazine. I'm wondering if this library probably used to subscribe to it in the past. You can subscribe for free. They, it's like a mini National Geographic that focuses on the connections between the Islamic world and the rest of the world. And they sent me over there to do, um, I went on three separate trips to study a folkloric festival. I interviewed some members of the royal family talking about the establishment of the first um, private college in Saudi Arabia. 
and I got to research more on my favorite thing, the costume, the folk dance and the folk music. It was, I was so lucky. So I got access to a whole other world experiencing Saudi women in a new way, even after I came back here. Then we had 9-11. I had drafted an er early version of the book that was based mostly on the time period when we lived there. And at that point, I realized I was so, so upset that these young um, Saudi men could have been so brainwashed, even though they were educated as engineers, so brainwashed into doing what they did that I felt I really needed to write about and call out the, what I consider the true spirit of Arabia. So I started to work on the book, and I did that by trying to tell the story of Shoma, that woman I mentioned before, retell it in a fictionalized way. This is the true spirit to me of Arabia. Storytelling, hospitality around the fire, they have a great sense of humor, um, the women are so hardworking, industrious, they just, they, they work so hard. And um, they're a lot of fun, actually. Saudis are, one of my professors at Harvard used to say, Americans and Saudis always laugh at jokes at the exact same time, which is kind of interesting. Because, like we have a similar sense of humor somehow. So here I started to think, how am I going to tell this woman's story? Here's some images of the old woman with her facial tattoos, which were common back then, and the young woman in her full flower as a marriageable age girl who gets herself into some trouble. Here's a map from the book. And um, you'll note that there are no country boundaries because Back in 1915, there really weren't. It was kind of the Ottoman Empire and the modern states that we have today had not been set up yet. So to avoid all the confusion, I just said put the cities in. The book takes place primarily in Jeddah with some in Taif. When I start to tell the old lady's story, we start in northern Arabia and she runs across the desert disguised as a cousin with her handmaiden, her servant, and they end up in the city of Uneza. So her own story is really about her escape. And I don't want to give too much away. They end up, uh, there's also a lot that takes place up in a beautiful mountain valley in Taif, up above Mecca in the Hejaz as well. I just want to show you the sites. These are this is a verdant area where they have farming. They have a, a large industry of rose cultivation for rose petals, and they make the attar of roses there. They even have a rose festival. Who would know they have that in Saudi Arabia? There's the desert crossing of the great Nafud. The Nafud is the central desert in Saudi Arabia. Massive sand dunes, this orangey color. The crests move east to west with the prevailing wind. And the dunes are hugest on the outer edge. So as you enter it and as you leave it, the, du the dunes are largest. Here's a sandstorm coming across. More pictures of the dunes. And of course, the desert, when it, when it rains, the desert will flower. At last, they reach this oasis, this place called Uneza. And these are scenes from the old houses of Uneza. Uneza is an oasis town in the smack in the middle of Saudi Arabia. A hundred years ago, it was known as the Paris of Najd. It's in the province of Najd. The people there had had long, continuous contact with the outside world through long distance trade. They intermarried with women from India and brought them back. They would send off their sons to, off to Cairo or Isfahan or Bombay. So they get they'd get quite sophisticated and they would come back. They had their own handicrafts. They had their own form of self-government that was, um, you know, like a, a simple city-state, but it was like a, a, the first of equals type ruler. This was known as a very tolerant place. Here are some more scenes from it. And on the left here is a men's coffee circle inside somebody's house. What they would have is the tradition of hospitality. Every Saudi home has a men's salon where the male guests come and hang out. 
and you'd, for, you'd serve them coffee, and today, of course, you'd watch videos or the soccer game or whatever. In, in Uneza, in the old days, you'd have a live campfire right in the middle of the room. So, of course, there's an opening at the top, and <laughs> notice they have this pile of wood in the back. That's their wood pile <laughs> to throw onto the fire. That was a sculpture. No, it's not a sculpture. <laughs> firewood. Um, so you can see where it is. Right there, there's Oneza. Unbelievably, it's, it flipped for many years to the exact opposite of what it used to be. Um, twist of fate, this preacher named Al-Uthaymin was extreme, an extreme fanatical preacher, came to light there and he lived there and he became a great inspiration for Osama bin Laden. To the point, it got so fanatical there that when I was there on a research trip for an article, I um, met and hung out with some folk musicians from that town. And I met them in Riyadh. They were living in Riyadh, which is to the south, down here. It's maybe a two-hour drive. So I emailed my editor and said, can we go to Uneza? I really want to do a story about blah, blah. He goes, don't you dare set foot in Uneza. Just don't. You know, it was... I believe that character is going to switch back if it hasn't already because the entire country is kind of turned a page from the more conservative views and they're opening up. And I hope for Uneza that it will once again be what it was. I consider the old Uneza the essence of what old Saudi Arabia is, the true essence of Saudi. People always ask me about the book cover. It's super colorful. <laughs> Here's some details. Um, I found a, an illustrator. I really wanted an illustrated cover because um, photogra photographs just wouldn't do it for me. I really love the book covers of Alexander McCall Smith in the, um, the uh, Madame Mara Motswe books. I wanted something that's friendly and ethnic and colorful. So this young illustrator for Beacon Press in Boston is allowed to freelance on fiction books because they only print, they only do nonfiction. So I wrote to him and said, would you take this project on? He says, yes, send me the book. Took him two months and he um, came up with all these different concepts. This is how it started out. We picked, my husband and I got our heads together and we picked, you know, some of them and said, okay, give us a first sketch. And then you can see the one that we eventually settled on was like this. This concept came together. Here it is more on the left, which was another sketch of it. At one point, notice you've got a lot of black color there. And I just got in touch and said, we're not wearing black here. This is about the colorful part of Saudi culture. This is not about what we know typically, no, no stereotypes. And then he said, you got to do a collage. That's the latest thing. So what they did, he, he did was cut out pieces of paper. You can see it on the cover when you look at it closely. And um, you work with the, the you cut out, you paint pieces of paper and then you cut them out. You lay them on a board and then you photograph them. And so it has some depth and shadow. But before we could get there, we had this issue of the pantaloons. Do you see those leggings that the girls have? That would be so wrong. I said, no, no, you have to get pantaloons. And so I found, thank goodness for the internet, I was able to find this photograph of little girls playing in one of the neighboring countries. And you can see how the pantaloons are long and baggy and they have like, you know, embroidery and little decoration at the bottom. And so he goes, okay, I can work with that. And also the bright colors, which I thought was fabulous. And so in the end, you can see they have the little pantaloons. And the colors are um, found also in this painting by an Iraqi woman artist. And uh, she also wanted to make a statement, I think, with the painting on the right in terms of the bright color of women's culture over there, which is in direct contrast to what we normally think. Around the edge of the cover, you have um, this black and white patterning is actually evoking the women's weaving that they do. The Bedouin women do hand weaving. 
on ground looms that they can roll up and carry with them when they go from place to place. Here's a couple of images of another woman weaving and a saddlebag. The women not only wove saddlebags, they wove the tent partitions, their narrow strips that they would sew together. They also wove the actual tents. So the women created their own housing. And they have, I mean, it's a way, it's a way they can express themselves. They put in um, geometric figures, whatever suited their fancy, sometimes tribal um, markers, kind of tattoos or, or um, signs. And sometimes, so here's an example of a how the partition works in a, in a tent. So the men are, you know, they know the women made it. It's just, it's part of this holistic cooperation between men and women that was part of the old ways. And here are some examples of um, how you even, they would do animals and geometric patterns together. Then we have the issue of women driving. Um, for a long time, I, re I had a blog, I still have it, I haven't taken it down, where I felt that the issue of women driving wasn't getting enough attention in the media, so I started posting every article I could find in English on my blog, just news, just to keep all the news in one place. And um, in my book, the last chapter, it's almost like an epilogue, is dated 2019. And in it, women are driving. So when, when I published this two years ago, my husband and I sat down in the summer of 2017 and we said, well, we have to pick a date for that last chapter, but we can't do it too far in the future because all the characters couldn't possibly be alive. You know? And I was, we just had to say, okay, let's just assume by 2019 they're driving. And, and if they're not, who cares? It's just fiction anyway. We can dream, can't we? So we hit the publish button on, officially it was September 15th, 2017. 11 or 12 days later, they made the announcement they would finally allow women to drive. And we just could not believe it. Oh, pretty shocking. And from that, so many changes have taken place. Incredible changes have taken place. Even every week there's another um, kind of loosening of the very kind of the, the restrictions that women have been um, coming up against. And this is my favorite, this is a modern Saudi cartoon. Um, this is a woman driving her foreign driver to the airport to send him off back home. And she's saying, oh, we've gotten to the airport. My dear driver, have a lovely trip. <laughs> it's like sayonara. <laughs> and um, I was amazed by that. It just shows how ready I think Saudi society was to get rid of that law and move on. And this was in the paper, maybe one of the Arab English language papers, about two months ago. And I could not believe this. Um, this was from the mountain towns around Taif. Remember I mentioned Taif up above Mecca? Every summer, late summer, they have a festival that's um, in honor of a great literary poetic tradition called the Mu'allaqat, which is the, the most famous um, poems of pre-Islamic Arabia were celebrated at the city or this area called Okaz outside of Taif. And they've had a festival there for a long time and part of it has always been males doing horsemanship and people reenacting you know, who the old poets were and reciting their poetry. And this time, for the first time, this year, they've had women equestrians. And to have a woman out there riding like that, hands-free and in the paper, it just shows how far things have come and also how you can see how um, women relish and are proud of their culture. They're not putting it all behind them. They're coming at it in a new way. So I am all yours for questions. Thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. So fire away. Yes. I have a musical question. Yes. Simply because of something you said in the pictures you showed us. Uh, 
You said you're a musician. Yep. What instruments do you play? If that's I play the Arabic oud, okay. like that woman in the picture, and I'm also fi I'm a very terminal beginner violinist, and I play percussion as well. I'm one of the organizers and um, the administrative director of the Arabic Music Retreat, which is a week-long um, music retreat at Mount Holyoke College. We've been doing it for 23 years now, coming up on 24. Okay, I was going to ask you if you got drawn into the musical community when you lived there. You and know, performing with other musicians. No, because I didn't learn to play until I came back here. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is always the way, you know. You. I was living there and I met musicians, but I didn't have the opportunity to learn. I learned with a bunch of people um, in Cambridge and Somerville, Mass. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. Do you, are you a musician? Yes. What do you play? Uh, piano, weekly, flute is my principal instrument. Yeah. What genre? Everything. Okay, <laughs> that's great. I think Sharon understands. <laughs> But, you know, I, I actually, I would describe myself as, as a flute player specializing in unaccompanied pieces, etudes. Oh, wow. Compositions for unaccompanied flute. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Beautiful. There's a, uh, unfortunately now passed away, fabulous oud player who's Armenian-American, Alan Shavarshbardesbanian, who is from Bath, Maine. And um, a lot of their, there's a whole community of Arab, Arab American and American musicians who studied Arabic and Middle Eastern music with him. There are student ensembles at Bowdoin, Bates. Um, there's a music conservatory in Portland. And I think USM may have an ensemble as well. So there's a lot in, in the universities and colleges. There's a lot of Arabic music, believe it or not. Thanks to Al. We, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go first. Right. Um, just a quick. I was listening to NPR very early this morning, and they were talking about the language, and how social ma media is really hard in Arabic language speaking languages because they all have their own dialect, like you had said. So as social media moves and changes the Western world, it's also being addressed there and how there are, they already have young people working on how they can um, have a universal type of language through social media using all their own little dialects. Well, so you know, it's interesting that I would love to hear that story because yeah, there is a modern standard Arabic that they use in the newspapers and that all the, you know, the news readers use. So they have that. It's just that maybe the young people don't want to do it they and they want to text. It that way. You know, even texting, they have their own. They have their own. Language. Yeah, they cut. And so, having that statement, how do you, how did you handle being, um, you know, an American woman going over there into this totally different culture for women? And did it bother you, or were you, um, I would find it really hard to go over and have to, you know, comply with how you dress, how you, who you go out with, what room you sit in, men or women, that would be really difficult for me, and I wonder how it felt to you. Um, you know, for me it was like a huge anthropological research project, so I loved it. I loved the exoticness and the, ch and the, dif and the difficulty and the challenge of it. I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, and because I knew, you know, we were right out of college, we were making very good money, and I, I wanted to research the culture, especially the women's culture. I was anxious to get into the women's culture and understand it. So I didn't, I would, you know, costume if you need to, you know, cover up for an evening or wear a particular outfit, no big deal. It's like when in Rome. Being married to an American, my own age, with no family responsibilities, no kids, you know, we're right out of college. Um, it was an easy way to be over there. And he also, we both spoke, we, we both speak, read, and write Arabic, so we understood everything going on around yeah. us. So we didn't feel um, like we were in a completely alien environment. We could understand everything, and we Even got the humor, you know. You could, it was, everything was... Of course not. I mean, it's, it's like even... Um, 
any country you go to in Latin America, any other region that's different, you have to, you have to um, somehow manage and just say, yeah, I'm not in America right now. I'm here for a couple of years and I'll do my best to save up money for graduate school and do some research and learn everything I can and try and improve my Arabic. So that was our attitude. We didn't go in. We went there voluntarily. I went there voluntarily. I think a lot of wives who went, I think less so now because it's so much easier for families to live over there. You know, they, they go and they cannot work. Their husbands are probably middle to upper level executives making extremely good money. So what they would do is build um, compounds for um, Western executive level employees. And in fact, I think I know a lot of women that lived in that world and they loved it. They had young children. They used it as a time to spend, um, to raise their young families without the distractions of having to work. They um, probably had domestic help which would be really inexpensive. And um, they had kind of a lovely lifestyle, but it ended and they knew, you know, I'll be here three years, four maybe tops, and then I'll go back. And usually um, they went back with good memories of their time because it was so unusual. You know, if you, right now they're opening up to tourism for men and women. They're begging people to come see us, you know, firsthand. Don't listen to the filter of the media anymore. You have the chance to go and explore it. I mean, it's an amazing country, so much geographic variety, and the people are fascinating. So you can actually go there and see it for yourself. And I think that openness is going to help our understanding of them and their understanding of us. I mean, they understand us a lot better. There are thousands of Saudi st foreign students in this country, thousands of women. The new ambassador from Saudi Arabia to the U.S. is a Saudi woman. She's a princess. She's the granddaughter of the founding, great-granddaughter? Great-granddaughter of the founding king. Um, and she's quite a firecracker. She grew up in the Washington, D.C. area because her dad was the ambassador to the U.S. And watch for her. She's really completely fluent and um, She's really a force of nature, and I think she's going to um, bust some stereotypes for all of us. But it's a really good question. Yes? She, was Faisal her grandfather? Yes. Which means her grandmother was Efat, who was the, one of my favorite characters, and I didn't write about her in the book, maybe referred to obliquely. She was the one who pushed for women's education and fought against the clerics for it, and um, she was a pioneer in so many ways and tried to push forward, along with her husband Faisal, the two of them tried to modernize Saudi. Unfortunately, he was assassinated in 1975, and it kind of threw modernization off the rails, and everything just was going wobbly for many, many years after that, until recently, and even now it's kind of going at an unusual pace, but I think people are grateful that there are changes uh, for women and societies opening up really fast. Tonight, I heard Frontline is doing a two-hour special on Saudi Arabia and Mohammed bin Salman. So that should be pretty interesting to watch. The question I had was, um, what was the kind of pervasive view that the women you were with had of the West, the Western women? Oh, very. Okay, so I mean, I met everyone from, like, the daughters of King Faisal to women from villages. So you have to, you know, based on your education and your sophistication, um, those who had traveled in the West, they understood us, they went to college in the West. They're, you know, our stereotype of them is mirrored by their stereotype of us. And the stereotype is that women are used and exploited for marketing. We are, we don't treat our elderly women correctly. We put, we put family members in nursing homes. They would never do that. You are at home until your last day. Um, they think that women are forced to go out and work and to, uh, you know, yes, they just see women as being exploited by our society. 
And of course, you know, there's truth, and yet there's stereotype in that, in the same way that we have stereotypes of them. But so I would say, you know, depending on who you're talking to, there's a whole range of opinion, and there's no one typical Saudi woman, just like there is no typical American woman. You could not describe a typical American woman. And so you cannot describe a typical Saudi woman because you have the whole range of society.